you eat or to sleep? That is the question for us lions. This morning, it is I, Leah the lioness, who is watching the antelope. A herd of bubbles is moving around very near here. My pride has put me in charge of watching out for the best moment to pounce on them with the least effort. My territory is in Central Africa, in the heart of the Sahel region, to the southeast of Chad, in Zakuma National Park. Until now, Zakuma was a true paradise for us lions. There are more than 3,000 square kilometers to share between 150 of us. In my pride, we share the work. While one of us keeps an eye on the prey, the others in the family rest near my mother in the shade for 20 hours out of every 24 hours. I am two years old, like my brother and sister. My brother's mane is starting to grow, but it remains short. A long mane keeps you too warm. This is the dry season. It's 45 degrees centigrade. Here, our males have adapted to the heat, but if the climate warms up even more, their mane is likely to disappear completely. That's Leo, the dominant male of our pride. I can't imagine him without a mane. Our young lion's coats are still spotted. As we grow, the spots will fade. In a few months, I will have a beautiful unified fawn-colored coat. The pads under my paws serve to mark my territory. The glands they contain deposit my scent everywhere I go. A tree providing cool shade next to a waterhole. There is no better place to sleep with one eye shut while watching prey. The waterfowl gather here by their thousands, but I need four kilos of meat per day. A bird doesn't compensate for the calories we burn catching it. Midday, the hottest hour of the day. The prey rushes to the edge of the waterhole. I prefer to wait for sunset to hunt. It'll be cooler and I'll be less visible. A plump warthog is rolling in the mud to protect himself from the sun and rid himself of parasites. There are baboons too. Ah, something much more nourishing, a buffalo. Killing one would feed our pride for several days. There are 8,000 of them in Zakuma. That means lion alert in baboon language. The head baboon spreads the warning all over the savannah as soon as he sees me. He thinks he's protecting his family, but as we say, when the baboon howls, the lion drinks. I share my territory with my distant cousin, the leopard. Our species have evolved separately for nearly 10 million years. My little neighbor, the African civet, is a cousin even further removed. We shared an ancestor 40 million years ago. It was tiny. It's in France that scientists have found some of its fossils. The civet hunts animals that live in or close to water, like the bald eagle. passes this way only once a week, but it's always at the wrong moment. Mm. 
My domain is this vast, shrubby savanna. One of the last of this pseudo-Sahelian type to remain intact in all of Africa. The dry season is far from over. For several years, the dry season has become drier and drier all over the Sahel. Yet, the giraffes still find something to eat. The mothers are wary of us. They keep a very close watch over their young. We call them white giraffes, a subspecies of Central Africa. They only live here in southern Chad and in Niger. Ostriches. Nothing but skin and bone. There are only 400 elephants left in Zakuma. This is the consequence of years of poaching, but they are now well protected in the national park. Their population is beginning to grow again. They have nothing to fear from the acacia thorns, and they replant the savanna by excreting the seeds. They appreciate them, especially the young ones, which are tenderer and easier to catch. Our elephant's biggest predator is man. Our elephant's tusks remain small due to defensive selection, because the ivory poachers have massacred all those with large tusks. My brother and sister are keeping watch. Dorka gazelles. That's how we young lions train. In May, the water level falls sharply. The crowned cranes come to peck at the remaining green stalks of grass at the bottom of the waterhole. It's also there that the warthogs, dama gazelles and bushbucks come to graze. Ah, here are my best friends, the National Park Rangers. They protect us and our antelopes against poachers day and night and never lay down their weapons. Several of them have even lost their lives in the line of duty. At dusk, they set up their bivouac close to the waterhole. If my prey were threatened, they would immediately intervene. Like every evening, the red-billed qualias come to drink. A billion and a half of these small birds live in the Sahel. They are grain pillagers. When they swoop down on crops, it's a catastrophe for the peasants. But here in the bush, they have every right to help themselves. Dusk is when the elephants come to the waterhole. By lowering its head, the giraffe takes a major risk. If we pounce on its neck, it won't be able to lift its head up again. This evening, mother is taking my brother and me hunting. We still need lessons before we can fend for ourselves. But during our entire lives, we'll hunt as a family most of the time.
we slowly approach the pupils. We start to circle them. They've heard us. The hunt is on. Finally, we've caught a buffalo. At the beginning of June, a clap of thunder announces the rainy season, which will last until November. It's an absolute deluge. The temperature has dropped by almost 15 degrees. In just a few days, we've gone from extreme drought to floods. All the rivers are overflowing. Between the dry season and the rainy season, nowhere in Africa is the contrast as great as here in Zakuma. In the Sahil for several years now, nature has shifted violently from one extreme to the other. The droughts are getting worse and so are the floods. There's water everywhere. This suits the monitor lizard just fine, but not us. We lions hate getting our paws wet. The grass becomes green again. The grasses offer a charming view. The herbivores are delighted. The baboons gorge on the fresh, tender shoots. The insects have multiplied. The insectivorous birds feast on them. From the little hornbill, the carmine bee-eater, to the Abyssinian roller. The rainy season makes life very hard for us carnivores. I almost regret the dry season when the vegetation was sparse and dry. There was a clear view of the prey. Now, the leaves are thick and the grass is very high. How can one expect to catch an antelope in this? This plump roan antelope is getting on my nerves. Since there is water and grass everywhere, the prey is dispersed. Instead of following a herd, we have to track them down one by one. It's impossible to attack these water bucks. An aggressive male is protecting his little family. The giraffes are more and more elusive. The Thompson's gazelle would be a fine catch, but it runs too fast, even if I do run at 60 kilometers an hour. Oh, 
I'm not going to settle just for a guinea fowl. The guinea fowl is a quarry for the jackal, and even he has trouble getting up close to it. When everything is soaked, the only place we can keep our paws dry is the track built by man. Everyone, including the giraffes and the baboons, leaves their tracks on it, even their urine. The butterflies come to absorb the mineral salts it contains. The rainy season is the mating season. These two water bucks are fighting over a female. The great hornbill is showing off his splendid red throat. His mate has a blue throat. The weaver birds are busy. Some males are repairing their nests from last year. Others weave brand new nests with fresh grass. Leo, the big handsome male of our pride, is having a hard time. He will be the father of my future lion cubs. Normally, Leo's job is to protect us females and our young from being attacked by roving males, and we females hunt for him. But our pride is dispersed. Leo is alone with his brother, and they are both famished. They would like to attack this small family of elephants, a female and her big cub, escorted by a male. Leo is waiting for the right moment. The elephants are unsuspecting. Bad luck. The males sense the danger. Leo gives up. The rangers have just spent a week in the bush in the pouring rain. They need to rest in the village. So do their horses. They pass under the herons' nesting place. The herons are very active. They need to feed the many young herons. I'm having a lot of trouble catching prey in the bush, so I try to get close to the village of Sakuma. In the village, in addition to the rangers and their horses, there are all sorts of creatures that are good to eat.
In the rainy season, the warthogs come up close to the huts. They come to shelter from predators, like me. They settle in well among the ranger's horses. As herbivores, they get on well together. Nightfall is the hour of the lion. I take the track leading to the village. I will roam around the huts until dawn. Without success, the domestic animals are locked up and the warthogs are nowhere to be seen. I go back to the bush. The track is a borderline. On one side is my territory, the national park. On the other side of the track is the peripheral zone. The herds from neighboring villages are allowed to graze there. This morning, the children from the village are leading their goats here. Nothing would be simpler than crossing the track to help ourselves, but that's risking death. Life is so unfair. The goats aren't allowed to cross the track to graze in the national park, and for my own safety, I can't leave it. The savanna has changed a great deal. Normally, the rainy season lasts six months. It's vital for us lions. It enables the herbivores to put some weight back on. But we are growing impatient. The frogs are having fun. It seems that the rains are becoming more and more violent in the Sahil. The climate is increasingly shifting from one extreme to the other. March, the drought is well and truly here again. I've managed to survive thanks to family solidarity. With my mother, my sisters, brothers and cousins, we have shared the prey. In December, I spent nearly a week with a handsome Leo. And 110 days later, I hid under the tree with the thickest foliage I could find. That's where I gave birth to my first litter. That was four days ago. They still have their umbilical cords and their eyes are shut. At birth, each one of my three offspring weighed no more than one kilo. I weigh approximately 150 kilos. They keep moving all over the place. I have to keep bringing them back to my side. The handsome Leo, their father, does his duty as the dominant male. He stays a few days close by to protect us, but his role as father will stop there for the time being. My brother and sister also remain close by. After the births, my pride protect me for a few days against roving lions, hyenas and leopards who could come and kill me and my cubs. I can't wander too far from them. They need me every minute of the day. After a few days, Leo and my brother and sister leave. I remain alone with my cubs, and I'm hungry. We settle down for a good night's sleep. They say that when you sleep, you don't feel hungry. Well, we'll see if it's true.
At nightfall, the giraffe would like to drink. It hesitates. I can guess what Leo is going to do. The next morning, the vultures are already hovering around. The marabou stalks too. They will have to wait a long time before helping themselves. Leo and his brother have killed the giraffe. Leo has already fed. His brother has claimed it as his prey and is standing guard. A delicious smell of fresh meat wafts over the savannah. But this giraffe is too far from my hiding place for me to help myself. And lions don't provide home delivery for young mothers. My pride won't bring me a piece of giraffe. My cubs are growing day by day. They're starting to open their eyes. One of them is developing much faster than the others. I call him Young Leo. Young Leo keeps claiming the best teat and biggest cuddle. Handsome Leo has recovered his appetite. He's reclaimed his place, and it's best not to approach him. The battler eagles are waiting for their turn like everyone else. giraffe had tough skin, but Leo has good teeth. The two brothers take turns guarding their prize night and day. They have no intention of sharing it anytime soon. Let that be known. Meanwhile, I'm getting hungrier and hungrier. I'm going to have to do something about my next meal. Hmm, these bubbles interest me. It's the first time I leave my cubs alone. My three little monsters are getting greedier and greedier, and it's exhausting me, which is normal after three births. I've always hunted with my mother, brother, or sister. That's why catching a sable antelope alone is mission impossible. I'll try a booble instead. Mmm, the booble was the right choice. After my meal, I keep watch over the leftovers from a distance. At the giraffe waterhole, the red-billed qualias are the only animals who aren't intimidated by the lion's presence.
Once the males have helped themselves, my mother and sister are allowed to take their share of the giraffe. Their blood-stained muzzles show they've been feasting. Leo's brother has gone back to his prey. The secondary predators are growing impatient, but as long as the lion is there, they don't dare approach. As soon as he goes off, the vultures and marabou storks rush to the carcass. of intestine is so good, it's worth fighting over. Careful, a plastic sandal is not edible. The rightful owner refuses to abandon his property, even if he isn't hungry anymore. You need to command respect. In a few days, the level in the water hole has dropped. There are just a few mud-filled holes remaining. The mongoose are content with that. So are the baboons. Young Leo is constantly fighting with his sister, little Leah. Little is a figure of speech because she's as big as he is. The objective is to get the best teat. My cubs are growing more and more beautiful, but not wiser. In fact, these fights prepare them for the harsh realities of the savanna, which they will soon experience for themselves. The usual practice among lions is to remain hidden for 10 weeks after the cubs are born, before going back to the pride, as a precaution to avoid other adults trying to kill the cubs. The water hole is now dry. All that remains of the giraffe is a pile of bones. The scavengers are fighting over the last scraps. The ibises have joined the vultures and marabou stalks. The heat is getting more and more intense. 
It's gone from 43 to 45 degrees centigrade. All the inhabitants of the savannah are seeking shade. There isn't much to hunt. All that's left are carcasses. I'm going to look for water in the last river where there is still some, the Bar Salamat. The Nile crocodiles occupy the last water hole. When the river also runs dry, all they will be able to do is shelter in their lairs to wait for the next rainfall. I wonder where my pride has gone. It has deserted our usual territory. I explore the area in search of them. Part of my family has emigrated to the south, like the elephants. A group of 300 has gathered under the acacias with the thickest foliage. The elephants are hot, but that doesn't stop their appetite. Not a single acacia tree trunk can resist them. The broken wood lets the acacia gum seep out. This interests man, not elephants. Attacking a herd of 300 elephants is completely reckless. My brother doesn't persist. Everything is very dry. The bottom of the water hole is full of tracks. The lumps of mud are as hard as stone. The grass has turned to straw. The baboons only have roots to eat. I won't have the strength to feed my cubs if I have nothing to eat. I've eaten the whole bubel, but this is no time to leave. The hyenas have spotted my cubs. They're waiting for me to leave to pounce on them. They'd make just one mouthful of them. My cousin, the leopard, has the same bad intentions. Not only do I have nothing else to eat, I soon won't have anything to drink. The river has run dry.
My antelope and all the herbivores have moved away to where there is still water and grass to graze on. I'm worried. With the increasing periods of drought and extreme flooding, my savanna is becoming increasingly arid. I'm worried it might turn into a desert, like northern Chad, which used to be as green and wooded as Zakuma. That was seven million years ago. Hundreds of species of animals lived there. There was also Tumai, a human ancestor. The paleontologist Jim Dumalbai Aunta was the one who found him. It was somewhere in the region called Torres Menala that I found Tumai. The skull that we called Tumai on the 19th of July, 2001, in this region. In N'Djamena, the National Research Center for Development has preserved Tumai's skull. It has been distorted by millions of years of fossilization. Tumai was surrounded by huge animals, the giant ancestors or cousins of those who live around me. The prehistoric crocodile's jaw is gigantic compared to that of today's Nile crocodile. There is also a giant giraffe with a huge jaw compared to that of the Zakuma giraffe. At the University of Poitiers in France, the paleontology laboratory uses a PET scan to analyze the inside of fossils from Tumai's period without breaking or cutting them up. Researchers want to compare the fauna of the time with the fauna which lives in Zakuma today, where the landscape is similar to the one where Tumai lived. Paleontologist Michel Brunet is the man who identified Tumai as a human ancestor. I wonder if my ancestors lived next to Tumai. Clearly, seven million years ago in Chad, there were no lions. But it's also clear that seven million years ago, there were many cats, and they were all saber-toothed cats. You start with a size comparable to that of the panther to end up with that of the Siberian tiger, 500 or 600 kilos. When you have neighbors like that, it's best to be able to climb trees fast. Those tigers were my cousins. In seven million years, climate change has transformed the landscape and the fauna. Is that what I can expect? Patrick Vigneault, the director of the laboratory, explains. In fact, for a long time, we thought there was a link between the disappearance of a species and a change in the climate. And we said climate change caused the disappearance or the migration of a given species. In fact, it would seem it's more complex. We're dealing with a much more complex system of ecosystems, like the current ecosystems. And we know that the climate doesn't directly influence fauna, but can influence plants and therefore herbivores, which in turn have an influence on the carnivores who follow them. What is important to find out is not so much the intensity but the rapidity of the change in the climate. In a hundred years, mankind has managed the feat of changing the climate extremely quickly, and the whole problem can be summarized as follows. Will the plants have time to adapt? How will they adapt to this rapid change? And of course, how will the herbivores and carnivores adapt? That's the real issue with human-induced climate change. The carnivores are going to have to follow the migrations of the herbivores. If this takes place over a relatively long, natural period of time, the carnivores will follow the migrations of the herbivores. That's what we know they're doing in East Africa, in the big national parks in East Africa. But if this migration is rapid, that's something we don't yet know. I don't think we have enough data to know how the predators will react in relation to the big migrations of herbivores. My cubs are growing. They are opening their eyes and are getting more unruly. We'll soon be able to leave our cozy hiding place to join my mother, sister, 
brother and the rest of the pride. But there's a new threat, bushfires. At the end of the dry season, everything is so dry that the smallest spark can trigger off a fire over hundreds of acres of bush. Small animals can't run fast enough to escape the flames. The secretary bird will soon be eating grilled snake. My cubs and I have escaped the flames. Three months in isolation is enough. I've met up with my pride. While my cubs remain under the protection of my mother and sister, I go hunting again with my brother. To survive, we're going to follow the great migration of the herbivores. Inside the national park, the great plain of Amduma still has enough water to last till the next rainy season. Herdsmen from the entire region bring their herds to graze here. I dream of a cow, but I have learned the hard way that it's dangerous. We lions have been persecuted by the herdsmen. Nowhere in the world does livestock farming cohabit with wild carnivores. Livestock farming is one of the temporary solutions man has found to deal with changes in the climate. When they no longer found enough game in the wild to feed themselves, they started to raise cattle. But when the climate became drier, they raised sheep, which eat less than cattle, then goats, donkeys and dromedaries, which are even more frugal. Then, as their lands turned to desert, they had to move to the south, which remained more humid. This has happened during the entire history of the Sahel. Animals and man have migrated in the same direction. Our fate and that of man are linked. When all the water has gone, we lions will no longer be able to live here. But neither will man and his livestock. In our common interest, man will have to try to mitigate climate change. Because we lions can do absolutely nothing.